Our next speaker, uh, Sarah Bernhard, is on the other side of this experience in so much that she's taken her product leadership skills and applied it to solving the problem of what if you're in trouble? What if you're suffering from depression? What if you've just lost somebody and you don't know who to turn to? What if you don't have a team of people that you can reach out to? Where do you go? Who do you reach out to? And if you're a millennial, you're going to be doing that not on the lifeline that you and I grew up on, but with text. And she's taken that idea and turned that into a really awesome institution. So welcome, Sarah Bernhardt. Yeah, okay, so Heath asked us to pick a theme song, and uh, I don't have a theme song. Um, but, Adam, but I said anything with Adam Duritz and the Counting Crows because he was my prom date in high school. So my little claim to fame, good old Adam. So let, how many designers are in the room? Wow, nice. And uh, product leaders? Any researchers or engineers? Great. Marketers or business people? Just generic? Yay. OK. Um, and has any, had anybody heard of Crisis Text Line before? Yay. Oh, good. Do you volunteer? Yay. Oh, really good. Um, so Crisis Text Line, um, as Heath said, uh, helps us um, uh, crisis Text Line is there to help people who are in crisis. And it turns out when you're in crisis, texting is this awesome format. So think of a kid who's being bullied in school who can text from the cafeteria and nobody knows what he or she is doing. Or somebody who is crying hysterically and can't get the words out, they can text. And it's a wonderful medium. And on top of that, we can collect the data from these texts and do smart things like identify who's in imminent risk and move them to the top of the queue if we have a lot of texters who are waiting. Typical 800 numbers can have wait times up to two hours. And we can answer 90% of people in imminent risk within five minutes. So Crisis Text Line is an amazing organization. Um, and <clears throat> there's 60 million people a year who suffer from mental illness, and they're quietly struggling with things like anxiety, depression, bullying, homophobia, thoughts of self-harm, eating disorders, and even thoughts of suicide. And Crisis Text Line wants to be able to be there to help them. But I'm going to fast forward into the future. And in 2020, we have 10,000 volunteer crisis counselors who are helping these texters on demand. And academics are publishing studies about the impact that we're having on the world because we've trained over 20,000 crisis counselors in empathy and compassion. And those counselors are taking it back to their communities and impacting the communities in bigger ways than just helping the texters get from a hot to a cool calm. The academics are also um, writing about the impact that we've had in the mental health community itself to make them smarter about forms of care. So it's a really exciting mission that we're on, but it's not that easy. So I came to Crisis Text Line in February, and this was not my idea. This was the idea of Nancy Lublin, who's the CEO. She created um, this, this service, and there are TED Talks that she's given about how she came up with the idea, and it's incredibly inspiring. But I came with a background in offline and online the last 10 to 15 years running product teams and user experience teams. And when I looked at the problem that Crisis Text Line had, we have massive growth in people in crisis, but we need to generate an army of volunteers 
who are engaged and who we can retain for years to come to help these texters in order to meet that demand. So I realized it was going to be really a, a problem of designing the total experience for crisis counselors from the application process to make sure that we're finding the people that have the grit that it takes to help somebody in crisis to what their training experience is and then ways to keep them engaged over time so that the training that we give them pays off. And <clears throat> the other thing that wasn't so easy was the day that I started, our only designer quit. And um, we, we still have an intern, this great guy named Sam, who's going to go back to school in September. But I realized we were really going to have to build a design team. And then likely, I would have to help engineering and product and everybody else in the organization learn how to create an environment where the designers in the room are truly inspired, because this was a hard problem that we were solving. And, you know, um, Crisis Text Line has given our volunteers, um, they have solved the most highest need that people have, which is having a sense of purpose. We give the volunteers a way to have an impact that's bigger than themselves. They help people, they change lives, and in many cases, they're saving lives. What Crisis Text Line hasn't done as much of is understand the unstated needs that people have. So these are needs like the need for a sense of belonging in a community, the need of recognition for a skill or capability that you've developed, and then even very basic needs of safety or the security that the training that we've given you will take you through that really difficult text. And so for us to um, come out with these insights and build them into the experiences, I realized we needed to create this environment where there was design thinking going on across the organization. So what I'm going to share with you today is five principles that I'm bringing to Crisis Text Line to ensure that we have an environment where our designers are thriving. So these are personas um, of uh, working with designers that doesn't work. And when I realized what I was going to have to do at Crisis Text Line with our culture is I reached out to old designers that I had worked with in past experiences, and I said, what are the horror stories that you've all had? And they came back with some pretty good horror stories. So the first persona is Bob the Builder. And Bob the Builder likes to fix stuff. And he... Uh, he fixes things without really saying what the problem is in the first place. So what this looks like in a design review is he might say, OK, take the logo and move it further up to the left and make it a little bit bigger. Bring the call to action up into the middle of the page and reduce some of that copy because it's really wordy. And then take this image over here and move it to the upper right, but flip it out with this other image that I like better. And the designer's sort of sitting there thinking, OK, I can do all these things, but I have no idea what it's trying to accomplish. And instead, Bob the Builder could be saying things like, you know, it feels like this page is a little cluttered. Could you think about the layout and maybe the copy so that we can give some breathing room to the page? And he stated his problem and the direction that he wants the design to go to. And then they're really able to come back with a much more creative solution. And then there's the Cheshire Cat. And the Cheshire Cat just lacks logic altogether. <laughs> and what I see, I see this happening when people are working with designers and they're not a designer themselves, which is fine, but they're trying to use language of design. So they th say things like, can you make it loud but in a quiet way? Or let's make this really elevated but be scrappy. And the designer is just left with not a lot that they can work with. And then there's Goldilocks. And Goldie, the Goldilocks, I call this a syndrome that teams have. The Goldilocks syndrome is when you're doing review after review with very little productivity or improvement to a design. And this can happen when different people are showing up 
to the different reviews. So in the first review, you might hear as the designer, gee, this image is really big and it's dominating the page. Can we make it smaller? And then in the next review, a new group is there and they say, this is really dominant and um, let's make it, or this is too small, let's make it bigger. And then in the third review, a boss shows up and says, God, why is this so dominant? We've got to make this smaller. And so the designers are sort of left with what they started with. And it's just unproductive for everybody. And then there's Veruca Salt. And Veruca Salt just wants it now. And the problem, when te teams want to please, and when they hear they just want it now, they'll try to figure out a way to give it to you now and give it to you quickly. But what is really unspoken is they're skipping steps. And those steps in their process are really, really important. I saw this actually happen at JET when I first arrived there. We had um, a little bit of time with an engineer, and we wanted to fill that time. And there was a merchant request of us putting up a deal flag. And this deal flag was going to call all this great attention to a product that had a deal. And um, so we slapped that deal flag up. And uh, then another merchant came to us and said, well, I have products that are refrigerated, and we need to let people know that they're going to arrive fresh and with refrigeration. And then there was another merchant a few months later who had a product that was a clearance. And clearance was different from deal, so, the, so they thought the customers would recognize that. And so we ended up with all these different flags on the page. And what the original designer who did this deal flag really needed to do in the first phase was step back and assess all the different ways that we could call out products, come up with an iconography um, system for that and go through that steps to think through it. Because ultimately, the, what, what the merchandisers thought about the pages that we had after these months of slapping things up was that we had cluttered pages. And so it just serves to let designers go through their process. And then the last two are really quick. This is Amelia Bedelia. I actually didn't know who she was, but uh, my daughter knew who she was. And Amelia Bedelia, um, takes things far too literally. And business people can get themselves into trouble if they're being too literal about the design. And so we've heard things like, will FPO really be in that final image? And then designers lose all respect for you. <laughs> and then the princess and the pea just focuses on very minute details that really don't help move the design forward. So something like the, a word, a single little word, in sample copy that isn't going to be the final copy. So these are the, um, you know, these are the bad examples. And with the five principles that you can apply to your organizations to build an environment where designers are really thriving, I learned these over the years as design evolved from being an engineer who was creating the design because he just wanted to, um, to start coding, this really happened to me in a startup back in 99, to uh, or the early 2000s when we kept design roles very separate. We had visual designers and then technical interaction designers, but there was a hard handoff between the two, and that handoff was costing us time, so we started to combine those roles and get, that, get all that goodness into one person, and then, the design teams really started to look at the complete experience, and they started to pay attention to what is the experience of the user when they receive the package, or what experience do we create when customer service is answering the phone, is the language that we're using on brand. And so designers started to influence more and more across the organization. And now when I look for great designers, I'm looking for that designer who can facilitate a conversation across marketers or product people or the technical folks to really narrow down the problem that we're trying to solve so that their design solution that comes back is relevant. So I'll go through each of these principles. And the first one is self-awareness. And self-awareness 
is really, if you're not the designer, admit to yourself that you're not the designer and trust the designers to do their jobs. And likewise, the designers need to have very healthy respect for everything that the business users are signing up for and committing to so that they're solving the problem in relevant ways. And then <clears throat> it can get a little gray when, when I think about um, user insight testing and research, it can be a little gray whose role is what. It used to be that we believed the product owner was the only person who could facilitate product research because there was this myth that the designer was too emotionally attached to their design and so they couldn't be objective when doing research. But the reality is there's plenty of product leaders and even engineers who are totally attached to what they think is the right solution. So what I look for when we're doing user research is who's that person that can sit side by side with a customer who's struggling and it's uncomfortable and it's painful to watch them as they're trying to figure out what to do. But that person is comfortable with that and kind of leans in and carefully asks, what are you having trouble with? And then the user starts to unload, and that's where the real learning of the team can start to take place. And that can happen anywhere. That could be a designer, it could be a finance person. At Hotwire, we had this very introverted designer who didn't say much to most of us, but he was very meticulous and detailed. And it turned out, in a lab, he was completely comfortable watching the customer struggle, and he never jumped in to save them. He just let them struggle and sort of teased out what was going on for them. So self-awareness, very important. It'll build, uh, build the team and let everybody um, perform to their strengths. OK, the next one, <clears throat> the next principle is empathy. and. A good friend of mine, Phil Terry, who's with Collaborative Gain, he loves to say the number one thing that we all have in common is we're not looking at this from the perspective of the user or the customer. And so I like, when I come into new companies, I often bring everybody together and do user research because I found and it's an, it's an incredible bridge builder between the designers and the engineers and the product owners. And doing the user research together evens the playing field of our knowledge of the customer. And so it's a good bonding experience. But then you have to create this experience over and over and over again so that you're consistently bringing products to customers. When I came to Hotwire, the CEO there was kind of freaking out because they had been a startup that grew up over the years, and all of a sudden they started to launch products that were actually hurting the business. And um, that's scary when that happens because you're doing the same thing that you've always done but having bad effects. And they weren't quite sure why this was happening. And the first feature that launched right when I got there was customer reviews. And customer reviews were very, um, tried and true feature that would help a customer make a decision and a choice about a product. So it Are we good? That's me. Turning on. It, it turns out they don't work on a site like Hotwire. And what Hotwire was selling was hotels in, a, in a, an opaque experience. This means as the customer, you get a certain amount of information about the hotel, but you don't know the name of the hotel until you hit the buy button. And, it, and in exchange, you get really low prices. And what um, what the team had done was they built the review before launch, and they saw that there were going to be some problems, but when they launched, the conversion rate just tanked. And what I had learned at Baby Center watching customers read reviews was that 
customers jump first to the most negative reviews, and they read them, and they get a lot of dirt about the product. And then they go up to the positive reviews, read those, decide if they trust the negative reviews or not, and make their own decision. And in a product like Hotwire, where you're rolling the dice and taking a leap of faith that the, co that the company is going to make a good choice of your hotel, um, when you read a negative review, you bail. So it didn't work. So we, uh, we created customer labs that were very scrappy. They weren't inspired, they were just scrappy. And um, we had our exec admin start recruiting customers on a weekly basis. She ensured that we had eight to 12 spots every Thursday that product teams could sign up for. They could show uh, these customers their designs at any state in the process. And we did it with two meeting rooms, one that had uh, the facilitator and the customer, and then another room that had the team sitting there watching through a WebEx. And we did this quick, like it took us about two weeks to set all of this up. The recruiting was definitely the hardest part, and we took that off the shoulders of the teams by giving it to the admin. And in exchange, we told the product team they had to be showing their designs um, consistently to users throughout their discovery process. So empathy, really key, great bit bridge builder between the different functions on the team. The next principle is self-management. <clears throat> and self-management really falls, I think it falls on the shoulders of the person in the team who has the most uh, responsibility and is probably the most senior because they're making the decisions. And in exchange for self-managing yourself with some of the goals so that you get to the most important goal of what you're trying to solve, um, the designers will really come back and surprise you. And where I saw this was with, um, again, an example with Hotwire. We were very late to the game with mobile apps. And it was ironic because Hotwire is a last minute service that um, the closer you get to the arrival date of your um, hotel stay, the better the prices are. And so our customers knew this and they tended to book very last minute. And the designers had gone out and watched customers who were using mobile competitors and they were actually booking their hotels as they were getting off planes. They were walking through streets carrying bags. And it was very awkward situations when they were making their hotel choice. And so we started to zero in that the most important goal for this app was for it to be easy and rapid. And they came to me and asked, if they could forego some of the features that we had added over the years in our desktop experience. So for example, we had an, uh, an experience of upselling the customer to insurance products, which added ancillary revenue to um, this cash cow product of the hotels. And they wanted to get rid of the insurance upsell. We also had a bunch of marketing opt-ins for emails and promotions, and then we had legal opt-ins for our T's and C's, and they figured out a way to consolidate those into a single click when you hit buy with, small, with fine print. So we needed to advocate for that reduction uh, with the legal team. And um, so it was hard to give up this revenue, but in exchange, we believed that we would uh, get a much more rapid adoption rate of our app, which was really the most important problem for us to be solving at the time. And true to form, when we launched the app, we actually um, got a penetration rate of 85% of our last minute bookers using the app, downloading it, and activating. So that was an awesome result. And then the, the last part of that story they also came to me two weeks before launch and said, we want another two weeks because we, we realize we need to get the itinerary built into the experience before we launch. And I was, I couldn't believe, I was like, you guys, we are so late to market with this app. I don't want to wait another two weeks for an itinerary. It doesn't sound like minimum viable product to use that loaded term. And they said, no, no, let us do it. And so I self-managed. 
We waited two weeks, and then sure enough, when we launched, we got a five-star rating. Customers were specifically calling out this itinerary as the reason that it was helpful, because they could look up where they were supposed to be in the app. And that and the five-star rating, in turn, got us promoted in the Apple Store, and that helped with the penetration rate. So self-management, really key to let your design team delight you with great solutions. Okay, um, fourth principle, inspire. This is a tough one, um, but there's a little secret that it's, it's tough for business people to be inspiring to designers, I think, but the secret is design teams can figure this out for themselves, and um, great design teams that I've had had self-organized um, self these quirky little ceremonies. So Snapfish, had their, the team, when I got there, every Tuesday the team would break for tea and have this precious little moment around tea. They'd share exotic teas from around the world. They'd make interesting little finger foods and they would do their design reviews. And they loved this moment. And then the Hotwire team would take an afternoon off once a month and go to the San Francisco MoMA and be inspired with the great art and artists that that museum was bringing in. And then most recently at JET, that team who was very thoughtful about how to influence all parts of the organization, they would reach out and find design leaders in their own companies who had created design thinking environments and they would bring them in for a lecture series. And so these teams were very inspired. And what I got from that as the business leader is teams that were actually pushing the envelope against standards that were out there. So these were teams that were figuring out new ways um, for customers to interact with our um, mobile app or our desktop top app, app that gave our product teams a little more flexibility in the choices that they had. So for example, coming up with a new movement in mobile that validated what the user was doing. It was just a slight little movement that emphasized what the user had just done and so the user knew that they were doing the right thing. The team at Snapfish figured out how to telegraph to the user that there was more going on under the fold so that we could expand our real estate below the fold. So these were inspired teams and they were, they were doing creative and new things. So the last principle is design leadership. And <clears throat> this, this means giving up leadership to others. And it used to be that when you would do big reviews of a product status or um, you know, at a milestone of product development or discovery, when you're doing these reviews with lots of senior people, the product owner would lead that review. And at JET, we started to have the designer walk everybody through their design whenever we were going through the design. And we did this in the mode that was the primary mode for our users. So even though design showcased the best with desktop, we were very disciplined about always doing this in the mobile app. And the business, user, the business owners showed up to these reviews with curiosity, trying to understand the choices that the designer had made and why. And the designer was expected to be able to talk about this. And this kind of leadership of design led to a very engaged team. We actually, the design team at JET was the happiest, they were the most engaged, and no one was going anywhere. And this, coming from Silicon Valley, this was incredibly meaningful because design right now, at least in the Valley, I'm not sure about the Boston market or um, New York is tough too, but it's the most competitive role in the Valley and it can be harder to find a good designer in the Bay Area than it is an engineer. So you want an environment that is engaging to them and keeping them happy and this design leadership was really key for us at JET. So these are the five principles just to review and 
what I realized in creating these principles and sharing with them, sharing them with you, is that when I go forward at Crisis Text Line, I'm really going to have to be more like Albus Dumbledore in how we uh, manage. By the way, Crisis Text Line, all of our meeting rooms are named after Harry Potter. Um, the Harry Potter houses, and we're, we're big Harry Potter fans there. But, but Albus Dumbledore is this amazing leader who led all the diverse students of Hogwarts, and he developed them and their wizard skills. He did this all while leading an army of master wizards against the evil guy Voldemort. And he, he did it with inspiration, empathy, a ton of understanding, and he also let all of those around him lead in the process so that they were able to beat Dumbledore down. And so I leave you with that. And good luck in your own organization.